the bottom of it with your host, Josh Moriarty. Hello and welcome back to the bottom of it with me, your host, Josh Moriarty. How you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Today's episode is with Francois Titaz, known to his friends as Frank. He is an Australian music producer. You may know him best from the Gautier and Kimbra hit single, Somebody That I Used To Know. It was a worldwide smash. He won a Grammy for that but that's just one of the many things that Frank has done he worked on the Kimbra record he worked on the first record for her he's doing a a new album for a band called Low Moon which I've heard some of which is badass he's done a lot of stuff with Gautier all sorts of things he makes weird air conditioner sound music he's kind of a sound artist I guess and he's very intrigued by a lot of you know like different forms different ways to create music different ideas different ways to express yourself I'm, he's a very very interesting man I've known him for yeah a little while now It's we work together on a few things here and there over the years and every time I've seen him we've always you know you start talking and you just get straight into it with Frank he, he's not afraid to go there so buckle up here we go Francois Tites ladies and gentlemen enjoy well there's not many <sighs> it's still up here <laughs> later it's a proper studio Mm. has proper things this is a real one it is an actual studio yeah i mean it's interesting like that because so often you sort of go between working in formal places and completely informal yeah i'm used to it all i'm kind of used to more of the more of the not studio than the than the real studio yeah we did some of that we did a little thing at the red bull studio oh what was that like with miami horror recently yeah yeah it was good is I that mean, in la or in New yeah York? yeah in la right. in santa monica actually oh and it's okay. pretty uh it's kind of clinic clinical just because it's corporate yeah it has to be i guess yeah. they don't really put too much character into it but it's huge and they've got lots of stuff Right. I didn't know you could make that much money from an energy drink, but I should Drinks are where it's, where it's at. Known. It's the same, you know, 50 Cent did that with the putting, what well, the vitamin water or whatever it was. So that was his thing? Yeah, but then he kind of, uh, didn't he go bankrupt recently? He had some issue anyway. He was doing that, doing that in the uh, 48 Laws of Power. He kind of got into that shit going, yeah. Dre's done the best. Is he the first? Yeah, I mean, he wanted to do shoes and then... Jimmy, Th- is, you know, they just thought that was a bit obvious. So what they said, why don't you do headphones? And he's like, all right, you know. So it's just like where you're going to use your brand. There's a pair just here. Of Beats headphones? Yeah. Have you listened to them or not? I've never used them. I, right. I remember years ago when I first, when they first came out, I yeah. had a go and they were really bass heavy, which I guess would have been pretty awesome. And that would have been their sales pitch. Yeah. But I imagine now they've got all sorts of different kinds Oh, they got a few different t- types, yeah. But no one's really into them. Like as a like, you know, like musician wise, I find everyone goes, "Oh, I d- don't like these." You know, like. Well, they're just to sort of seem like they're a basic level consumer headphone. They're not for. Yeah. Do they make Do they make studio versions of them? I think they have ones that have studio in the title of the name of the headphone. Like. That's a good trick. How long have you been living? <laughs> studio, in <LA>? studio. <laughs> yeah, headphones. just put it in, and then people will buy it. Yeah. How long have you been in LA now? Uh, four, four and a half years. Has it been that long? It's been that long. Is that straight after somebody that I used to know? It was a bit before. So um, You came before the Grammys, is that yeah. right? I think I remember speaking to you around then or something. Yeah, so about probably six months before or whatever. We'd been sort of talking about moving since 2008. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and we were going to, originally we were going to move in 2011. And then it ended up being the place that was the middle of 2012 for everyone involved seemed to be the best place to kind of make it happen. So, mm-hmm. which is because it was moving the whole family in. That seems like a nightmare. What's that? Moving the family? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a bit of a nightmare. I mean, it still is. Like, God, you know, Jesus Christ. Families are bad enough when you don't have to move them. I don't have one. <laughs> it's kind of hard enough just moving yourself. Moving yourself, exactly. So what, three, three daughters? Three daughters, yes. And um, yeah, three daughters, and they were and when they first. How old was they? Were like eleven and seven and five or something like that when they moved. So, and now they're fifteen and thirteen. And did they 10. settle into school? Okay. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, I mean, after a while, the, the idea was that we were going to move, and then 
if everyone liked it and it was good, then we would stay or, um, you know, or we'd move somewhere else or we'd, we'd live in, like, I have no complaints about, like, I love living in Melbourne. I love it as a city and I really love, like, right. it's, it's, you know, it's really awesome. Um, Were you, so, did you grow up in Melbourne? or In the, in the in country Victoria. Victoria. Yeah. yeah. Out in a farm. And then you'd been there working the whole time until moving here? You yeah. didn't live anywhere else? No, no, I just had stints working in other places, but not like, not going to live anywhere else. Do you yeah. still have your studio there? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Still have that, yeah. Yeah, Lachlan runs the studio there. He's working away, beavering away, having a good time. I watched Wolf Creek last night. Oh, did you? Jesus. I... <laughs> what made you, what made you, <laughs> well, by yourself you... or with someone? No, by myself. Oh, God. You, you've got to do your, you've got to do your research a little bit, right? Uh, I'm sure I'd seen it before, though. I've seen it before. I feel like you gave it to Kimber or something to freak her Probab out. Probably and did. And I watched it with her. Oh, yeah, that'd be right. Yeah. And not to freak her out, just to kind of give her some context. It's nice to freak her out a little bit. Yeah, though. that's true. Yeah. She reacts so great. She's... She does. She gets big reactions. But probably, I probably did. Yeah, it's probably true. Yeah. Have you been doing yeah. much more film stuff? Is that... Not in the recent... Like, uh, I've been really producing records since I've been... Since... The last film I did was in 2012 or 2013, so which is a Julian Assange film, mm -hmm. and uh, which is fun. But since then, um, there's one project I'm going to work on next year, um, which is a, a film project. But the projects that I've pitched for here, the ones that I've been sort of really into, I've missed out on. So it's right. been the thing where... At, and then I've been having such a great time working on records, mm -hmm. then that's what I've kind of been going, I, I want to make this record. Yeah, let's do that. So yeah, I that's mean, what I I've been spending it... my time doing. And and also songwriting, like, because it was something where I'd only really, I was very late to songwriting because I didn't really write songs before 2005 or like when I said I've my got that you were, there was a solo album by Frank Titas in 1998. Oh, it? yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah, totally. But what That was not songwriting or your own songwriting or not, you haven't been working with other people is that what you're saying uh no i'm just saying in for, in terms of if you if you talked about um music in terms of uh um form purely uh -huh. in terms of form then i'm talking about songwriting as working in song form okay as a form so in other words um i used to work in uh i used to completely try and um, uh, what is it, uh, you know, avoid using form or try and find new forms or uh, uh, I was always searching to kind of um, negate or uh, work against um, forms. Mm -hmm. I remember that sort of, yeah. I mean, so, I think from observing your work... But I still do that in what I do now. But yeah. the thing is, then I, I, I love I love songs and I really get into, I love song form. And instead of working in these long form pieces, because I did a lot of contemporary dance work and work in theatre and things like that compositionally, and also that album and the other things. And a lot of those things are quite abstract. And they're... Oh, yeah, your, your SoundCloud page is just all ad, very, very abstract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, there's just like a whole bunch of things that I've written over the years. Experimental air conditioner... Sounds. Yeah, it's all that kind of like very, very minimal, uh, you know, searching for music that's hidden in environments or emotions that are hidden in moments um, that aren't necessarily controlled expressions. So, which I've always been really into. It's just something I'm really attracted to. Did that start young? How does that come about? I don't know how it comes about. I d yeah, it probably did. I mean, there's a couple of friends of mine who used to make jokes about that for me when I was in my teenage years because I used to love listening to things like like listening to fans or just being in an, env an environment and just, uh, you know, like being in this environment, like if we just like, listen. Mm -hmm. I've got a fan got this fan and then it's an air conditioner noise and whatever and if you sit like i find i don't know maybe i was just i was very shy as a kid so i used to spend a lot of time just kind of sitting and then listening and then i'd find that in the silence the my imagination would be taken away by you know like i get taken away with it and i mean it comes back that really comes back to growing up on a farm because it used to be you know i've got a lot of memories of lying awake in my bed and just listening to 
the outside environment, which is very quiet. You'd hear a cow in the distance. You'd hear the odd car like two miles, you know, a couple of kilometers away because it's only like one road that's a couple of kilometers away. And you could hear it in the yeah. silence, you know, and you hear the odd airplane, like distant jet, maybe every few nights like not not a regular thing at all and so all those things had a real kind of lonely poetry about them and then when i moved to geelong which is the first town i moved to yeah i was really struck by that for the same reason because i used to lie awake at night and it'd just be the hum of the city and i found it so incredibly loud going from being in the country where it was just always these odd sounds and the sound of a cricket or a frog and then you go to this valley like we lived on a hill that went down into a valley where the river was and roads and you just have the roar of the cityscape just constantly there so i think it was very much like a exploration of those sounds not that i was into eno at the time like it wasn't yeah i, I think agree. the thing for me is that all that work is about not about maybe where eno was coming from with that which is like where you have music that's buried within things and it's delves with the environment it's more to do with the movement the isolationist movement that sort of has to do with sound um having sound having meaning without you know, in of compos compositionally around you, it can sort of have emotional meaning when it's tied up with your personal life and you're able to tune into it. So I was very into that in my 20s. Yes. So, yeah. Which seems kind of weird to me now because I don't really do... Well, I mean, I love that now and I still kind of tune in and listen to things like that a lot. But... Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It wasn't something that I thought I could maybe make a career out of. I mean, that not that pe some people do, you know, like... Yeah. Um, do you think yeah. it's, do you think we've, I mean, there's not much silence anymore in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So for, for the, every time you're sitting at dinner yeah. and your friend goes to the toilet, yeah. you don't sit in, the, in that moment. You pick up your phone. Yeah. And you I just, don't. I, no, neither do I. I really make a point of not, yeah. of not doing that. But yeah. we're older. Yeah, that's true. You know? And... But the, the kids, they don't the know. The kids what, today. The kids today, man, they don't, they don't know. I mean, I, and I guess... It's the same as distraction, I'd say, with any of those things because you just search for it in whatever way. So I think it's a constant. It's maybe has more density now, but I just think it's changed to something else. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily matter as well. There's, I, there's the thing where you think because you've grown up one way, that's the way it should always be. And then you yeah. go, I, I worry about the But we were all fine. And we were being observed by older people saying we were going to be fucked up. So it, uh, it just changes. Yeah. The, well, the technology changes. I think the emotions are, are the same. I think the thing about, uh, I mean. The emotions are definitely still the same. Well, the thing is that it's that whole argument to do with, um, to do with progression moving at two different speeds. Because you have technical, technological progression, which you can see and is very evident through inventions and all that kind of stuff and technology. But the mapping human psychology or philosophy, when you look at the philosophical principles that are at play, the main ones that are happening in society in the West anyway, or, you know, followed on things that were from many thousands of years ago. Like if you look at Judeo-Christian teachings and whatever, which are the fundamental belief system of, or and in terms of, what is socially acceptable for how do people to behave yes. it's based on something from a couple of thousand years ago it hasn't changed it's fixed in, a, in many ways and it does progress but you can't see it. it's like this morphic kind of thing but it's very easy to see generations of iphone and you think somehow that you know that therefore as a society you are progressing in behavior but you know you look at trump and hillary or you look at any of those things you can see that fundamentally this brutal you know selfish um, yeah, we're exactly the same. It hasn't changed. No, and, it hasn't. And, and, and I was talking to someone about it the other day. Yeah, actually. yeah. It's it's a fascinating it's a fascinating thing. It's the same. It's and, it, and it's the same in music too. You know, be, you know, like uh, recorded music is is a technological industry fundamentally, and there's a lot of people who kind of written about that. But it's driven by format. So you know, the seventy eight, the thirty three, the forty five, mm -hmm. the CD, the stream, all those things then mean that an audience for recorded music or recorded sound take it on board in a different way and it has a different meaning just purely because of the format and if you look at a song that i've written in terms of the structures the melodic ideas and and whatever i can point to dozens of songs over the last 50 years that are incredibly similar to yes. all the aspects of whatever it hasn't changed it uses all the same forms and ideas to do with that in many ways 
Uh, and I always think that's really fascinating, but it's presented in a different way. It sounds different. It has a different thing about it. Oh, sorry. It's just my that's, phone. That's all right. Oh. I love it when an A&R person's going in to get a facial. And they'll call me after the facial. I mean, come on. Don't you love Los Angeles? I love Los Angeles. Uh, I'm happy being here. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's Do you need to get a little... facial? You can go and get a facial. I'm... Petty, you haven't done a male petty? Like, get a pedicure? Haven't done no, that? I haven't yet, right, but right, I'm right, becoming more yet. aware of my wrinkles since I've been Right, here. right, right. And you, can get, you want to get in Botox or... Nah, no way. <laughs> Can't do it. I just thought I might get some nice mm. moisture, some face care products. Right, right. But that's as far as it's going to go. Yeah. Well, you know, LA is a place where you can get a lot of advice on that, which is really good, like which yeah. ways to go in. Yeah. That's fine. Get a scrub. Get but a I, don't, going on. I don't want to have to... I'm terrified of becoming completely self-obsessed. Right. Even just... Being an, a musician, artist person, yeah. having to care about everything that I do and look at pictures. Of, I don't, I really don't want to be that much of a part of I like to look nice yes. and look kind of cool. I like your shirt. Thank it's you good. very much. Yeah. But I, I don't want to, I don't want to go to that next level of, yeah. of self-obsession and crazy. Yeah. You would have seen a lot of that, I'm sure, of people that you, you know, you must yeah. come across it. Yeah. Uh, if you look at like oh, most artists, that, like every artist that you kind of work with, is is very obsessed with their image in in some kind of way, where, mm. and whatever their image may be, like whatever they're going for, it's a very specific part of you know who they are. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're going real shabby. It's still contrived. It's still really contrived. Yeah. There's very few people who are actually just like, I just did this. This is what I look like. Wally, Wally Gauthier is like that. He's actually like... He seems like, really normal. He's very normal. I got yeah. him to go to like a really expensive um, hairdresser in New York that I'd been to for a haircut because is a, it, the, the guy who owns it, um, Marshall, is a friend, a friend of my brother's. Yeah. And I went, oh, that's fun. I'll go and get like a really expensive stupid haircut. Like that's kind of because I get my hair cut like once a year or once every two years or something. Um, not just through laziness, really, more than anything else. You're um, working. I can't, like, it, really, it is. It's a thing that's just like, it's yeah. going to now, like, I have to find a hairdresser that's going to give me not a fucking terrible haircut, okay, and then I ask a few people, and I go there, and it takes me, like, a couple of hours, and I come out, and it kind of looks pretty ordinary. Does it look the same as it looked before a little bit? Oh, uh, no, it's just like sometimes I've just had like, you know, scarring experiences with haircuts like that where I've walked out with, you know, feeling like they haven't really captured what's going on. So my last haircut was done by a member of the band I was working with, which was really good. So she cut it in the kitchen <laughs> in the Airbnb we were staying in Seattle. Have you, <laughs> have you had a, a desire to be ever to be an artist yourself and be the one I was hoping you were going to say to be a hairdresser oh no well away. we can do that you know, well that's the other I have a question from most people I interview is whether they have any hobbies that other, what would they do if oh, they, they weren't, weren't yeah, oh that's yeah. good yeah yeah uh, no I've never you mean to be an artist as in not that like you're a not singer an, or a, yeah like well someone who's got to present themselves and take photos of themselves oh, and it's the right, Frank right. it's Francois Titez and you're no. in the photo and you're not really, no. I'm kind of really interested in, um, no. I'm sort of like... Did it ever cross your mind when you were younger or anything? No, nah, no, nah, not really. I mean, I don't mind being in, it's just not a desire for me at all. I mean, that said, I'm going to, like, I've got plans for making a couple of projects that are centered around me, but they're not centered around me in a, in a sense of like... Um, your image as such. My, or... my image, it's much more collective in its nature. And that's kind of, I'm sort of more interested in collaboration. I think as I've got older, I've sort of been, uh, there are specific things that I, that I work on that are just to do with me um, as expressions, but um, in terms of the way they are presented or explored by people, I'm not really interested in them being connected to me as a person or a personality. I'm just more interested that they exist, mm -hmm. I think. Do you know what I mean? They have that kind of... I do know what you mean. And then if they have some kind of context or place for something, then... Uh, and that somehow is reflected in... Like this, like if someone wants to talk to me about some, something, I'm really happy to talk to them about it. But it's not something for me that I kind of like pursue or I'm interested in pursuing. I don't avoid it either. Like it's not a thing where you go, I'm not like a recluse. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in communication. But I, I, I'm certainly not... Like wanting to say, I'm going to do, 
a producer album and I'm going to have a photo of me, you know, on the cover uh-huh. or my name featured as being the center of it. You know, I'm kind of not interested in that. There's something about that. And it's not that I'm against vanity. It's just, it doesn't interest me. So yeah, simply. Yeah. It's all things I've been becoming more and more aware of. I don't know right. if it's something about being in LA or it's just getting older or it's just current culture and mm-hmm. the rise of Instagram and all of those these sorts of things. Yeah. But it it does freak me out and I always want to try and remain grounded as as right. much as possible. And I, I I, th- I think you can choose. It's just funny though. We, we're in this industry when, in, and so I'm about to start a new project or I yeah. have fans that I'm working on and, and the PR person, because you have to pay the PR person these yeah. days, right? They're all on the payroll. And they sort of just tell you, like, they have this blueprint or this way of how it's supposed to work. Okay? Yeah. You have to be Instagramming this much. You have to have your Twitter. Bl- and they're all just following a system that was created by some other people who were breaking the rules and starting something new. Yes. So I'm just like, well, no, I don't. I don't have to be posting Instagram photos of myself all the time. Maybe my, the, do you want me to post one of you? Can you do? A, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe the new thing is being is being not like when <laughs> when Rihanna deletes her Instagram. Yeah. Then everyone's gonna go, whoa, that was so cool. The new cool celebrity thing will be to not. Yeah. Be posting photos of yourself. So yeah. maybe I'm going to start the trend. Maybe I'm going to buck the trend. Yeah. But no one cares about me enough for me to be able to yeah. change the culture. So I'm, I'm, like, I'm going to try and hide and I'll just end up remaining hidden and no one will ever hear my music. Yeah, yeah. Which well, I maybe think the that doesn't of, matter. The nature of pop's like that. I mean, that's one of the things that I like about popular, popular culture is that it being amongst it in that way is really playful because you have to consider it all the time. Mm. So whether you're like... Um, you know, saying I'm into this or I'm not into this or whatever. It's like um, an expression of like what it is to be alive. So if that was in 1977 and you were in um, in London and you were deciding that you were going to get piercings and have a mohawk because you wanted to do this and you were Andy Thatcher and whatever and you were angry, yeah. that's as much of a statement as it is now that you could do in a in totally in another way like that, which is like I'm going to delete. I'm a very famous person. I'm just decided to delete all my media off the internet and I'm going to disappear. Or do what Sia does. You know what I mean? I'm not going to show my face and it's very provocative for her to do yeah, that. It's yeah. like I don't want to be a 40-something-year-old woman who's standing up on stage and being judged. I'm going to talk about that politically to say, is this me? Is it someone else? Am I acting? Is this real? Who am I? What, what are you? And ask all these questions about that. And that becomes a provocative, almost punk kind of act in many ways, where everyone's just like, this is cool. It's cool. But it's also pure pop because it's just talking about the moment of vanity, you know. And so it's you, kind of fascinating. Do you escape that by being the producer? I guess you, you would... do. You kind of hide it. I, like, I, I'm not really... I mean, the good thing about... One of the things about being a producer I really enjoy is the fact that you're kind of amongst those discussions and you're really at the core of what something is going to be but at the same time you're trying to be invisible as you can Mm -hmm. and um so that's a kind of real trick to kind of pull off like that is to say and it's also i think it's very good for me in terms of what you're talking about with grounding because i think producing at its best is kind of can be invisible from an ego point of view and it and there is a zen aspect to it that you have to embrace to be really good at it um do you struggle with the ego side not I, no i think i did in the start to start with i really wanted to have ownership i think it's as you get more mature and also as you're successful and as you see the success of projects happen because of the nature of collaboration mm-hmm. you then like you can if if you're if you're able to recognize that and you feel recognized in your work in that way and you don't require it then you don't really strive for it i mean that said it's always nice to be right but there's many different ways <laughs> to be right, you know. And yes. I, like, I like that. You know, like, I, I like to be right about things. And generally, I, I have to say, most of the time in the studio, I'm generally right about things, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, that's the thing I'm kind of good at, you know, so I try and that's do that. That's why they come to you. That's right. But at the same time, I'm wrong all the time. Like, you know, so I make a huge amount of mistakes. I fuck things up. I go in the wrong direction. But I know that through the path of getting to the end, 
that when I get to that end and when everything is kind of lined up to that, that mm -hmm. this end point is going to be right. And the path might, you know, be a huge fucking zigzag. Yeah. And I might make many mistakes and have many failures through that process. But in that end point, there'll be a moment of like real clarity where it's the, it's the thing. It's just more getting everyone to recognize that that's the case. So you, you have a, a firm sort of trust or belief in the process of just going forward, I guess. You must get yeah. good at that of just yeah. knowing. What do you want to do now? Yeah. Yeah. Let's move forward with that. And then it's whatever it may be. Like quite often it'll be a thing where I've got an imagined picture of what something should be in terms of how it should feel. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know quite how to achieve it. And in the nature of collaboration, it's like, well, what do you want to, what do you want to do? Like, how do you feel about this idea? And how, sh how should it feel? Let's try it like this. And it's like, let's try. My big thing is like, th there's no way you're going to know unless you kind of try. And if it's your idea and it's great, if it's my idea and you think it's your idea, <laughs> that's great that's the best if it's like if it's your idea and i'm you know like and we've just run with that and it's the right thing that's awesome and i haven't had any input on it um or very little input that's fine or if i'm like totally wrong about something and i've gone no 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 it's got to work like this and someone says i reckon it's got to be like this and they do it and it's like way better it's like that's great it's a pity i wasn't right <laughs> Uh, I was wrong about that, but like, this is genius, you know, like, you know, this is great, you know, and that happens all the time, but it's like having the, that's what I mean by the eagerness of just being like willing to take all that stuff on and kind of deal with as much as you can mm -hmm. without shutting it down, without like, yeah, being a, like a producer, producer slash, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Of course. Wagnerian producer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. call it, where you're going to just rule it. Do you have to, there must be particular sort of artists that, I mean, from observing you know, the people I know you've worked with, they are all quite driven and have strong ideas yeah. for themselves. Because I know a lot of people, I was talking to Dan Nigro about this yeah. and just saying a lot of a lot of people come to him with the songwriting, but they sometimes just don't have anything to say or they, it, it just seems like there's a lot of people now who want to be artists or musicians. Yeah for the sole reason that they want the notoriety or the the fame of it all, but not really with any sort of... I think that's always the same. It's always the same? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that's ever changed. I think the amount of... the amount of Like, because everyone's motivation... I'm really interested in what drives... When working as a producer with someone, artistically, I'm really interested in what drives someone to... Is there something you look for in particular, something specific? The that, biggest thing for me, I mean, apart from being amazing, is... Um, <laughs> In You've some had way. some amazing ones. You've done <laughs> but well. But amazing, yeah. You got to be like, you got to be amazing in some like, you know, be an incredible singer or have an incredible musical talent, have an incredible, you know, lyrical sense or well, whatever. There's like everyone has their strengths about what they do or a thing that they're trying to explore. But the, for me, that's a big thing is just like the fact that that music is so central to your life that you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So, and that's about the ambition. And generally, I find with the artists that I'm really drawn to work with. They're so obsessed that they just can't, it's, it's almost like um, a, a mental illness in the sense that they're so caught up in what they're doing to the detriment of other things in their lives that they're going <laughs> to pursue that. And almost every artist, I'd say every artist that I've worked with has that in some capacity. And yeah. it can come out in different ways, whether they become so insular and fearful because of that. Um, they could be really super, super into money for that reason. They could be just into like discovering harmony and incredibly complex arrangements and sort of make a matrix weird maze for the musical maze for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, like there's a lot of different things, but the thing is that they don't really have a choice. Yeah, well, I remember and they have when, incredible ambition. When you know, I was working with you and Kimbra that that little bit and just seeing her, it was yeah, she's driven mad by it. At yeah, that, at that period. Yeah, in her life. And yeah. It's like, yeah, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> I, I admired. It is what it I is. I admired that she had to. It's like she was one of those people who just had to has so, to do it. So desperate, and there's no choice, and that's incredible as a thing. Yeah, and it's difficult, and the thing to like, and there's no way. I think the thing about that is there's no way out. It's kind of like the only when you're in that space as a person artistically when you're trying to express something. Um, there's a drive and an ambition through that that means that you're going to find something to express, I think, um, whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. And it's not, this isn't a value judgment. It's more the fact that you have an ambition to try and achieve something that um, 
means that it's going to make something that's really incredible. That doesn't mean that it'll be commercially sex successful. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it's going to be an extraordinary piece of art. It, it means that it, but it has something about it. And that's very different to what you're talking about, which is like something that's purely about vanity or purely about someone just doing something for the sake of it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I've turned, I've said no to so many artists that I've met that I've gone, you know, met up and gone, okay, and you get in the conversation, they're like, yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to make an album or whatever, and then I'm going to get, you know, I was thinking about doing some acting or getting into whatever. Or, and for me, it's just like, that's cool, dude. I'm just not the dude for doing that yeah, for you. Yeah. Because your project is about vanity purely um, as opposed to like uh, some sort of deep, human need to kind of express something via a song mm -hmm. you know and i'm kind of really into that that's my yeah. thing it's like when you have it could be anything like there's a guy called dave brown who's a um musical improviser in melbourne who's in his mid-60s uh, he has a project called candle snuffer and dave was the original bass player in acdc um but then he was like really into mara vishnu and kind of art music mm -hmm. and and he's just been making weird improv small moment art music for 45 years you know what i mean that's what he loves that's what he does yeah i love working with dave you know i've made a whole bunch of records with him purely because you know like just this is the expression and the drive of just like yeah i just really like this instrument and let's make a piece that's based on all these different textures with it okay well let's do that you know record and well, you know what i'm saying it's, it's just like art for art's sake it is which i love which is, is kind of yeah i but think you, we need more of that sometimes well, i the thing is i think quite often with this it's funny talking about it in here is that that like you can quite often feel as though commerce works against that or it doesn't but art, like in the i think in the record industry at its best with artists and with record companies when it's really working is in that slot where the artist is like really going for it doing their thing and the record label is really in a place to support that really support that and help drive when it's needed or help but they're really just helping support that they're not just doing it for the sake of commercial outcomes have we have we lost that with the change in the industry do you think where they just there's not that that not, backing as much anymore not for me i mean i get a really long leash on all the projects that i work on which i'm very fortunate to have and those are the projects that i like to do where someone has a deep ambition i mean the low moon record that just finished yeah that album the reason why, well, I met with Matt, the singer from the band, and we talked about what he was trying to do. And he said, I want to make a classic album. I want to make an album that's a fucking great classic album. Mm -hmm. And I said, you do realize what that means. Like, it means a huge amount of pain and commitment to make that. <laughs> you, you, is that actually what you is that actually what Yeah, yeah, yeah you can, can you do that? Yeah, because if you want to do that, I can tell you right now, that's what it's... And he was like, he, he was, comes from... He's an ice hockey player originally when he was a kid. And so he's like really into sports. And he has a competitive kind of aspect about what he does. And he's like, yeah, that's what I fucking want to do. I want to make a fucking great album. And I, I said, like okay, it. well, let's fucking do... Let's get on it. You know, like, how do you do that? And it's like, well, it's going to be a band record. And he had to put his band together and find his band members. Uh -huh. And they had to be cult-like committed to the project in the same way that he was and their musical voices had to be distinct and real and part of that for that to work he had to have a group or collection of songs that really spoke deeply with what he was trying to achieve that he could stand completely behind that really resonated not only with him but with the band and then beyond with you know the people who are collaborating on who really believed in it you know there's a lot of aspects to do with that and then a project that like that takes like a huge amount of money and a year and a year and three months and he already had it three quarters written at that point wow so and like that's constant like you know i talked to him during the main part of that project apart from the i mean we were recording for maybe three months full time say mm -hmm. and then the rest of it was like um i would speak to him at least twice every day you know about right. some aspect properly involved <laughs> Staying in an Airbnb with the band, getting up every morning with him going, what the fuck is happening with this song? I don't know. I believe in it. It's fucking, what are these fucking drums? I don't know. <laughs> Do you think this melody is good enough? But like day in and day out for weeks, you know. I didn't know that still happened. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of what I do, Josh. <laughs> that's great. That makes me so happy, though, to know yeah. that that's... That and that's, that's supported by a record label. They yeah, pay for yeah. it. And, and we play it back, and they're just like, we fucking love this. This is great. You know, and I can very... I could be very proud to play you a song to say, I think this song's really great. Have a listen to it. I yeah. think it's a beautiful piece of music. Like, check I've it out. I've heard some of that. Yeah. Uh, Matt, the manager, was playing me a couple of Oh, did he? Oh, okay, tunes, cool. Yeah, a little while ago. And yeah. it sounded awesome. Yeah, yeah. But that's the thing is it's got that thing of like, we, what are we trying to say? We're trying to talk about the ins and outs of love and obsession about what it is to be, be with some someone 
and the and the good and the bad of that mm -hmm. from Matt's perspective, you know. Yeah. And from and from Dan's, you know, like there's a lot of Dan Nigro in that record too. Yeah, he was talk, talking to me about it. Yeah, it's yeah. got a really interesting aspect about how those guys work together on that. Yeah. Yeah, and the voice. Some of it's highly confused and amazing. <laughs> Sounds so it might be this classic classic album. Well, it's, I mean, I think it's really good. Everyone responds to it so well, but that's what we were trying to achieve, you know. Yeah. And I'm very goal-driven, you know, like, yeah, this is what you like to do. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> Though I remember just from those few sessions I did with you and something that I that I took away and I've always remembered was just the it's got a thing yeah and I'd, I'd never really thought about that before but just for for, for the listeners so that they, they know it was just like <laughs> I'd be playing guitar and you would tweak the tweak the knobs until it sounds like something it's always got to be something yeah regardless if it's the greatest thing it's just yeah and then when you listen to stuff that you produce each sound or each texture or each thing just sounds like sounds like something in, something interesting or something that's, there's an intention behind it yeah there's a thought that's saying i'm because i think it's got related to lyrics with that too it's just like well what is this personality is like what are you as a guitarist what are you trying to say on this song like what yeah. does this part mean is it bringing and it can be like sometimes it's that's just implicit in your playing it might be vague but it also can be something it's just like i'm talking about you know height or i'm talking about love or i'm talking about yearning or i'm talking about avoidance or you know like, there can be so many different aspects to what a sound mm -hmm. is or where you're coming from with it that can when you add all of those things up together the many parts in a song you know yeah well it's just something i look i look for now i respect stuff that has a thing regardless mm. of whether yeah. i, I love, like it. Yeah. love it or not yeah, yeah i just we went. We recorded this all the colors album out in Joshua Tree at that Rancho yeah. Studio out there, yeah. and it might not be the greatest album or anything, but yeah. I can safely say it's got a thing. Yeah, like, we were there for a week. We recorded yeah. with all the stuff there, and it sounds like something. Yeah. So yeah. regardless of whether you love it or not, and it, yeah, it's like something I always want to continue to do. And yeah. I, I, yeah, you sort of taught me that a little bit. Oh, cheers. Oh, that's good. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Intention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hmm. Do you do you have any hobbies outside of out of this? What else is it just full time um, obsessive music? Mostly, I mean, in the last few years, it's really been a lot of music. I mean, there's things that I'm really into that I haven't spent time doing in the last few years because I've really just been making records and writing music and whatever. And also, you know, like moving the honestly moving the family here has been like a you know a very time consuming and takes a lot of effort to make it so that everyone is finding their path here. Mm -hmm. um, and enjoying what they're doing and, you know, and supporting them through that. It's not something that's kind of, you know, I, I mean, I suppose I could just go, yeah, girls, yeah, just do your thing, whatever. But, you know, it's not the kind of parents Kaz and I are. So it takes a bit of, takes a bit of effort. I'm really into cooking. I do a lot of, I do it like um, today. It's, I'm in New York next week, so I've got to make meals for, a couple of meals for the week, which is part of my parental duty of being away. So mm -hmm. making a, I take, by request, so I'm making a meal of curries. I like with cooking that you do it and it's done and you see the result yeah. straight away and everyone yeah. enjoys it. Yeah. Whereas with music, it's just a shit fight a lot of the time. It is. Although, like, the last couple of days in here has been great with Leon because we've had his live band in and we're just right. cutting versions. We're doing, like, the most banal thing, which is, like, the like equivalent of Spotify set this session for a couple of days. Like, uh. here's acoustic versions of these songs. And this is one of those things that you might battle with with record label, which is they would say we just need versions of these for a playlist. And I say, well, they've got to be great. Like you yeah. can't just, and they roll their eyes and say, Frank, you know, cause I'm no, I'm, you know, my mantra is I may be slow, but at least I'm expensive. So, and, <laughs> and they're really used to that with like, they just go for fuck's sake, can you just finish this fucking song um, or whatever. And sometimes it can take me a bunch of time to kind of make something. It's just like that. And sometimes it's also just psychological for me too. But with something like this, it's beautiful. Cause it's like six songs, cut them all in three days. You know what I mean? beginning to end and it's like the band and we did this kind of like Alan Toussaint kind of boogie fucking version of one of the songs which really came which the band came up to in the room and so old school it's like they're all in the room together in here you yeah. know what I'm saying like all doing their thing That's and awesome. then yeah, Leon gets in the room jams with the band then he just goes in the booth and they cut a version of it he'll overdub some vocals later and then that's it. That's done. Travis, the engineer, is working on it this weekend. He'll be mixing on Tuesday. Six songs. Pretty few and far between like Woo! that. Sessions like that, though, isn't it? Ah, uh, I would like to do more. I mean, that's what it used to be like. I like, know. you know, you've written a song and whatever, you go in and do your thing and off you go, you know? Not this kind of picking away, picking away. So, so often with that, the thing, too, is that I think um, 
yeah, you don't necessarily. I mean, it depends on what the fuck you're trying to do, but but that kind of control it so often doesn't lead to better music. You know, I've spent with, a bunch of time with that in the last two years with people just going to absolute micro. And well, we have the ability sucking. now across all forms of media to make everything perfect. Yeah, which we it never used to be an option, so no one would really. You wouldn't know. You just you strive for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. now that we can. And then, but we we make everything perfect, and then we look back at old recordings or old images and things, and look at the beauty and the imperfection of those things. So, yeah. But then, still, people like they listen to an old record and go, "It's amazing." Listen to all the the mistakes, but then they'll still critique and fix every single thing of yeah. their of their own. Yeah. It's very very difficult to let go. I mean, I wonder if there's going to be a Renaissance movement at some point in the next five to ten years where people start really cherishing the imperfection i think it's always the same of like striving for i mean that's part of the singularity movement and everything else to do with technological change to do with human beings is that there's always the perception that there's something that you're striving for mm -hmm. that is some sort of perfection so it's the whole the reason why heaven exists as an idea yes that through technology you can reach heaven you know, so for someone like Ray Kurzweil or like the movement in Cal the modern singularity movement in California, you know, that's that's the idea that you could live forever, or that you go, or even this kind of Mark Zuckerberg thing of like I'm going to cure cure all diseases, or what he's is that what he's doing? I, well, he's giving three billion dollars to. What I think so, he's curing all diseases in a hundred years or whatever, and so, you know, and that kind of thing I just think is pretty much like being a Mormon in terms of the belief system it's that that for me is as pie in the sky as just saying that heaven is above us like as a belief to do with that because i mean i i believe that's possible i don't know the timeline on that i think putting a timeline on it is a little bit like putting a timeline on, on the electric on the you know the the self-driving car uh -huh. you know you know like it's like google is saying 2017 or something but i don't know if you've seen this car go at five miles an hour and as soon as like there's like a dump truck or something it you know you have to take over and get it around the old kind of thing like that and okay like you know what i mean it's gonna happen it's like it's definitely edge. gonna it's, happen it, but, but uh, yeah but don't put a timeline like you know it's just ridiculous we don't understand how a cell works you know what i mean like you know let, let's just kind of figure out cell biology or memory before you start making grand statements about i mean <laughs> How does apoptosis work in for cancer cells? You know, like we don't understand even the basics of what that is yet. And how can you say then we're going to solve all, all of diseases? You know, so this kind of belief for me is the same in music to do with the idea of like, I am going to absolutely make this thing perfect and therefore it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? But it's also, with art, how can you make... Art can't be perfect anyway. Well, and, and it's, it's the idea of when something's finished. I think that's the yeah. thing. Yeah. And it's hard with that. I think that a lot, of, a lot of perfection in music has to do with fear more than it has to do with anything else. Mm -hmm. Anxiety and fear. And I think at the moment it's got to do a lot with um, the fact that there is so much music and so much noise that's released is that you want your piece of noise to... <laughs> be regarded as being you know what i mean uh better than other pieces of noise so fundamentally if an idea is not very good then you want to give it every chance it can be to be the best thing it possibly can and i understand that i do that in music all the time i try and make every idea i'm trying to make the best it could possibly be mm -hmm. but you know i think when you strip it back there to like here's a great melody and a great you know, and if it's really that good, then like the, the songs that I've had real success with the last couple of years that haven't made it onto to albums yet, one of them's a classic where everyone hears it, just thinks it's incredible. And then it's, it's so simple. It's like a backing vocal, a vocal, right. a finger click and a piano. And that's it. Everyone's like, this, this is fucking songs great. Everyone just like instantly, you know, and it, we'll see. I think the fundamentals of it are just so strong that it then is going to find its own way and be, you know, do undeniable. You, did you foresee that with somebody that I used to know? Did I you? just thought it was a great song. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. All I kind of search for in music like that is is that all the songs that I've ever had success for, I go, oh, this is a great idea. I have no idea who's going to be into it, like, or how it's, whether it's going to be commercially. I just I know the feeling of like, oh, this is, I love this. Yeah. And that's it, you know. And then make it good, like make it the thing that you want it to be, mm -hmm. and then just see what happens, you know. 
Yeah. And then if people buy it, then that's cool. If they want it in their lives or if they hate it, like whatever. Of yeah. course. Uh, one final question. <laughs> this is an interesting one. Does this, is there a point where you would be fulfilled, where you've done enough? Does this have an end? Oh, I had a question. Like, I discussed that with Kaz the last couple of days. I don't really, like, I'm not driven like that, really. I'm just driven by things I'm interested in. Um, and you're so, always interested in something? Yeah. And it's, like, it's different. Like, next year, I'm going to do a couple of, like, you know, songwriting, like, more of the APRA kind of songwriting, mm -hmm. campy kind of things like that. I'm going to do two of those. Not because I'm into the songwriting so much, but I'm just more into the collaboration, ping pong you know, pinball machine, sorry, idea of like how things collide together yeah. uh, with people. And I think that's really, really important. Um, but in terms of like uh, more fulfillment, there's a pragmatic thing, which is I've got to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And so I probably wouldn't be working as hard as I am now um, if I didn't have to. Um, so there is a financial aspect to that, definitely. But I'm not really driven by, you know, like... Um, there's a set thing that I've got to do and therefore I'll be satisfied. I just want to make the, the music that I'm making, I just want to make it really fucking great that people fucking love mm -hmm. and that I'm really super into that I could go, hey, have a listen to this. I think this is really great. And then it has a meaning for you where you go, I love this. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's so, such a great feeling when music communi I think when it communicates something like that, when someone has a song in their life and they're just like, I, you know, it's really powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I, I guess that's why we keep doing it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think that's one of the things with Wally's thing, like that, like, with the Gotcha project that's interesting like that, is when something really has that strong meaning. I mean, it had that same, like, the Oz records are like that too, and Kimber's records are like that, and whatever, where you have these amazing things where people are so attached or get so emotionally involved with something, and it has such a deep impact on their life. Um, it's a very resonant, like, I love it because it's almost like magic, you know, it's kind of thing you can't touch or hold or own yeah, or whatever. Yeah, it's just yeah. like this feeling <laughs> and people just love the feeling. So it's a little bit like, you know, like having a friend in a way where it's just like you have a connection with people, which is just about that. I'm, it's great being alive. Yeah, it's great. Isn't it amazing? You know, even if it's like an idea that's depressing or an idea that it's just like, I know what that feeling is. And I, it's so beautiful that you've tried to express that in some way. Um, and you feel like that too. And I think that's a very powerful, just human, um, you know, what it is to be human. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like this down here though, this anxiety, depression. Well, we can, do you want to go into that? That's good. Is this about you or me? No, this is everyone. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's definitely a, a question and a, a c current conversation in the music business, the anxiety and depression thing, but. What do you mean? Is there a lot of anxiety and depression? But I think it, well, that's what I mean though. It's across the board. Everyone's got anxiety and depression. Really? Yeah. <laughs> There's a friend of mine who said, I live in an optimistic bubble. Like he's just going, you live in- you, Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's cool. Yeah. And I kind of do. Like I get like, you know, for me, I get depressed, but not, not never for a long period of time. Like I generally have like, you know, various times where I am, like in the last year, I would have been under so much pressure and been so tired. I think I would have been in tears on a Saturday, maybe three or four times, just have a bit okay. of a like, you know, a little kind of Terry's breakdown. good. You just, just like get it out. <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. And so that's a lot of pressure, you know, like to be in that, you know, in that space, in the headspace where it's just like, what the fuck? How the fuck am I going to pull this off? This is kind of impossible you know, when I've just been working that hard and whatever. But I know that that's like, you know, putting that into context, that's just the fact that I've just been working too hard. Yeah. And um, for, and I'd schedule it like that because of the pressures of er everything that was coming at me from various people. Yeah, so if you, if you chill, you'll be good. Yeah. Whereas I guess the people who are depressed, uh, it doesn't change for them. That's right. It's a constant state that you feel you can't escape. And mm. I think even in those low moments like that, I know because I've experienced it, that if I take a day off, have a sleep, do yes. you know what I mean? Then the little things. I'm going to be going, oh, it's all right. But I mean, when I was younger, it used to happen every single Wednesday. Like I'd be not in tears, but I'd be having a breakdown when I quit music because I'd go so hard. Like I'd be working hard. I'd do these super long 16 hour, hour days on Monday and Tuesday. I hit Wednesday and I'd just be like, I fucking hate everything. And I don't I'd realize do those like, days anymore. Yeah. The long, I don't feel like the studio, the studio day, <laughs> about six or seven hours. That's it. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can do eight, 
You can yeah. do 10, if you, but you still have to have a lot of break. But the 16 hours and the go through the night and all that, I don't think it really... I don't know. It doesn't I'll, do much for you. I like Nick Cave's 9 to 5 stays, eh? The 9, nine to 5 thing can work super well. It's true. Yeah. As you get older, it makes a lot more sense because it uh, it's very hard to maintain those hours, like going through... With the family as well. And yeah, it's tough doing that. I mean, when they were younger, I was, I used to, my house was near that, so I'd take a break and do all that kind of thing. And now they're more independent. Um, but also in Los Angeles, when you're in the studio, it's really hard. You can't really get back home. Like you're, kind of, you're just kind of there, you know, because yeah, it's just true. the nature of the distance. Um, yeah, but you know, there are a lot of people who are, are like you know that I deal with who have a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, but I'm pretty fortunate in that kind of in that kind of way. I think mm. I, I have been just my demeanour. I think, and always, also my the role I play in records is very much like that, which is you got to keep up morale, Frank. Pretty much, there's a lot of those things where you have to really be the person who is like um supportive and um uh will help someone through a situation hopefully not the person who needs help through a situation yeah yeah you know i'm gonna help my producer through this yeah it's not kind of the best thing ever yeah. it's just a it's a funny one and another thing i've been thinking about recently is the suffering for your art mm. and i think i'm trying to do it a little less. What suffering? You want less suffering? Well, no, it's not. You have to because you have to still be alive and live a be a human and yeah. do all, you know do the normal life things. Yeah. So, say the song idea comes to you in the middle of the night. Yeah. I really toss up now if it's good enough to get out of bed and stay out for three hours and work on. Right. Or if it's more important that the next day I wake up, go for my walk or meet the friend that I've got to meet, what's going to make my life, like why is art always more important than just being happy? Yeah. It's, and it, well, that, I mean, I'll always fight that fight. I, yeah. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. we all sort of do as well. It's really hard with that. But I think with also, yeah. Sacrifice and whether that's something that's like some sort of offering in some kind of way or if not and whether that makes better work or doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I know. I think I'm getting better. I mean, as the years go by, you start to, you know, what you can get away with and what you can't. Yeah. I think the thing is for me, it's more, I mean, it depends on the role you're doing. I think moments of inspiration for me are kind of like um, happen in like I think over time I've just seen them happen in so many different ways where I'm not in this habitual kind of thing of like the only way that I can make work or be involved in something is by going through a particular process mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying um, so that's taught me that basically I can pretty much do anything and something good will come out of that like I can be making a record where I'm very straight and well rested and good things can come out of that I can work on a record where I'm on mushrooms half the time and good things can come out of that. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can be incredibly tired and, you know, over it and depressed and, you know, finding it really tough and kind of feel very bitter about the people around me at the time and good things can come out of that. Um, just as I can be incredibly happy and, and uh, everything's cool and great things can come out of that. Um, like there's no like golden kind of like this is the process that I have to suffer through this yes the only thing I would say is that um, is that it kind of comes down to like decision making setting a clear goal of what you're trying to achieve <laughs> and then um, finding a finding inspiration with that and being hard enough to know when something isn't good enough to sure. be able to then you know, say, are we going to do something else? Because I don't think that's that's not quite right, even if it's tough. Well, yeah, the more you do it and the older you get, the more you can look back on your career and see your states of being throughout the process of creating all of this art and realise that the only thing that was constant was you. <laughs> like you yeah. were present. Yeah. So sadness or happiness or booze or marijuana, all these things, none of it really matters it's just you got to just keep turning up to work and eventually you get yeah shit, you get shit done eh? you do you do I, at some point that's the thing that i do at some point you've got to do the work like yeah. there is at some point someone 
And someone's got to do it. <laughs> That's why I find it hard by myself. That's why collaboration is so yeah, important because at least you can share the load. It is. And also I find, I find other people so inspiring and not necessarily like... Um, like, it, it, and it mightn't be the fa the good thing that they're, they're doing can be inspiring. The bad thing that they're doing could be really inspiring, you know, because it yeah. can inspire me into saying, let's try this. Like, no, I don't think this is working or, you know what I mean? As opposed to these are just the things I know how to do or, you know what I mean? You get, you get really pushed yeah. around by that. Um, but it's surprising. A lot, of, a lot of people don't want to fight for it. A lot of it's got to do with, like, I've got to say that all the really great things I've worked on have been something where you've got to fight. You've really had to fight you for You push it. that fight though, don't you? I reckon. Yeah, As a at, some po at some point, like when you go well, I remember for something, with Kimber, I remember yeah. just her coming back from the studio and having yeah. big rows, not rows with you, but oh, you totally. like just like going yeah. at her. Yeah. Especially because she was quite young at that stage. Yeah. So I think you were sort of just teaching her yeah. the fight and she fucking fought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it was yeah. great. It and worked it, out. That's important. That's, that's, I mean, the thing is that Kimbra is a classic of what I was talking about before, which is she's always going to do the things she's going to do. She had to have the skills and the recognition that she needed to be able to lead and be able to be at the center of the process and not listen to people around it. But she also had to be able to take on outside, you know, <laughs> Uh, influence in that and be able to collaborate and it's a tricky thing to have both those kind of skills and you learn them as you go yeah but you don't there's no way of being in collaboration with that without without having um disagreement and one of the things that can be very hard i think is like being able to cope with disagreement yes um and be able to see a positive out of that and also understand that it's just about ideas you know so yeah it's it's tricky and it's emotional with that like you know with someone saying, I don't think this is right at all. And these are the reasons why, and we're going to try it like this. So let's try it. Yeah. Well, I think that's <laughs> where the long term working with someone for more than just a very short amount of time yeah. really helps. Cause yeah. then you have that trust. I mean, m with Miami horror, it's, it's getting to that now where yeah. we can disagree a yeah. lot, but I know that we've, we're all just trying to make the best thing yeah. and not to take any of it personally. Yeah. And yeah. same with my, with all the colors, my other band as well. Just, yeah, yeah. But that's the that's the long term relationship kind of thing. I think that you it build is. you build that. You do, but you can also have it. You, I mean, you can get that trust. It does take time to do that. It doesn't happen in a day. I think mm. that's true. But it does happen. You know, it does happen if you just are able to spend enough time with that because there's enough in your relationship to be, for people to be able to 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 go with that. Yeah, that's certainly true. It makes a, it does make a big difference though because you don't get. As long as there's honesty in the relationship and all that kind of stuff, it's it, 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 it does. I think it can bring really great results. And I think it's also very important within that that you're always bringing new fuel to the fire. So it's not just like something that is like a comfortable relationship. It's something that's really progressing. And I think that's the thing that can yeah. be hard is always like, and I'm kind of really big on that, like it's always bringing in new collaborators or getting me out of the process or whatever it may be, like, but fueling something and thinking about something over 20 years or whatever. Don't think of it about as being like just what it is now, but like, you know, in terms of the piece of music that the you're piece making, of music, oh man, I'm the people I, that yeah, involved. Yeah. I agree with that as well. Yeah. I think sometimes it's a problem with just people thinking about the now of music a little too much. Yeah. You want it to still be good in 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about streaming that's so important, I think, because the thing is it really plays to the fact that if you make music that people really care about, that they want in their lives, then it's really different to say, this is just talking purely in a business sense. You know, you buy it on CD and then you don't on CD and whatever, which is very different to say you've got a song that people are just going to listen to over and over and over and over and over and over again over 20 years, which basically means that people are going to pay for it time and time and time again so you know across 20 years you end up you I know never thought about it like that yeah actually. so the math of that's kind of ridiculous um and the model of subscription-based model is the model that's going to be in place for everything and it'll be more cut up to do with this but if you make great work like that and you have an audience for it then it's certainly subs sustainable like you know if mm. you if you and and so it actually plays into the opposite of the singles market in many ways the way this new format works. It just hasn't, I don't believe it's been fully recognized yet. And I'm really interested with a couple of projects I've got going on coming up to see if they are embraced like that and how they work. Because in the past, there's been songs that are like that, like in the last few years, like um, Hosier's Take Me to Church is a good example of that as a song where 
in that year it had four times, six times the streams of other songs because people kept coming back and listening to it. Yeah. Not because the audience was bigger, just the fact that you needed that song in your life and you wanted to listen to it again. So it had, the, you know, it had a, such an emotional power about it that you, whether you, you know what I mean? I don't know whether you like that song or whatever. It it's a good song. It's a good song. I heard that the first time. I was like, this is a great fucking song. Someone, someone played it to me. So right. it was one of those ones. They're like, yeah. check out the song. It's a yeah. good song. And I remember where I was. Yeah. So that clearly means it was a good one. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a reason why those things happen. It's a great song that's really connected with the time that yeah. uh, politically and emotionally and whatever. And it's a really great performance. Um, and therefore, it's su- sort of sustainable under that way. So that's one of the reasons why... I don't have the depression and anxiety to do with those things. The other thing, the thing that's hard about that is to make that's really hard. <laughs> so, you know. To make that is, yeah. yeah, nearly impossible, but you've got to be in it to win it. You do. And the other thing is you have to be striving to try and, and there's no shortcuts. You just kind of make things and whatever it may be. But I know if you play the averages, in other words, if your work generally is really good and it has a place like that and you're trying to express something as a, as a human being, whatever it may be, <laughs> then it generally it finds its place, whatever it is. Doesn't it, It's not necessarily the biggest thing, but, you know, I'm kind of more, yeah, I'm not interested in being the kind of biggest. It's more about just individual expressions of ideas that have some sort of currency emotionally and yeah, the fact that they're in play. Like I was talking about, it's like friendship. It's just, yeah, it's music. It's just like, yeah, there it is. It's awesome. <laughs> And if you can pay the bills, that's awesome. That's good too. Yeah. That's good too. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Uh, cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. It was a pleasure to have him on the show. It was a pleasure to get the time to sit down and pick his brains about it. You know what he thinks about music. It was very, very fascinating to me. I think he's uh, very, very, very talented. Everything that he does, he works extremely hard to get the best possible outcome and the best thing out of the music of I've seen him in action and he is quite the genius so yeah great to sit down and talk to Frank that's all for the bottom of it for today but keep tuning in plenty more episodes coming thank you for being a part of it take care bye bye